everyone. Welcome to the University of Kansas Pre-Medical Night. My name is Lisa Pinamani Cress, and I'm the Director of Admissions at the University of Kansas. And we're so excited to have so many prospective Jayhawks joining us from around the nation. We are almost at 250 who have joined us, so we're excited about this turn turnout tonight. And we hope you are ready to learn a little bit more about what it would like, what it would be like to be a pre-medical major, um, pre-med major at KU, and what it would be like to uh, go to medical school. I want to thank our, I want to thank our partner, the KU School of Medicine. Uh, this is a program that we do every year, and we usually host it at the KU School of Med. But uh, as you know, COVID has allowed us the opportunity to switch gears and be creative and have virtual events, which has allowed us to actually expand the audience and have Jayhawk, prospective Jayhawks joining us from around the nation. So again, thank you to our partners with the School of Medicine and all the KU faculty and staff who have joined us tonight. I am thrilled to introduce the many doctors that have joined us. We actually have several different doctors joining us and three doctors are our first speakers this evening. Um, we have our chancellor of the University of Kansas, Dr. Doug Gerard, and he is uh, the chancellor here, but he is also a head and neck surgeon. He's been our chancellor since 2017. And prior to that, he was the executive vice chancellor at the KU School of Medicine. And it has been, as a staff member at KU, it has been a true honor to have a doctor leading our campus um, to open KU safely through this global pandemic. And just to have weekly updates from him on the health and safety of our campus. And we greatly appreciate all the work that he constantly does, not only for the University of Kansas, but the entire state of Kansas and all of the patients that he has worked with throughout the years. So, Dr. Gerard, thank you for joining us. And I'm gonna turn it over to you. Thank you, Lisa, and good evening to everybody. Thanks for joining us tonight. It looks like an action-packed program, so I'll just say a few words. Uh, uh, first of all, we're thrilled that so many of you have an interest in a potential career in medicine, um, and I'm sure you'll hear from all of my colleagues tonight as well what an incredibly rewarding uh, profession it is, and uh, uh, even in incredibly challenging times like a pandemic. Um, and and it uh, is just just heartwarming to see so many people that have an interest in the field. And and uh, as I sit in my position now, I really have an opportunity to think about and observe uh, the role that KU as an undergraduate institution plays in preparing students for successful careers uh, in many different areas, but certainly in medicine as well. And it it certainly. Uh, helps that we have uh, obviously our own medical center, our own uh, school of medicine, uh, which is nationally recognized in, in multiple areas, but also a world-class health system as a partner uh, by which to gain experience uh, in, in the clinical setting um, and, and is uh, both rapidly growing, but, but hugely successful as well, and as you'll hear from some of our counterparts. Um, and, and so really, as I look at the undergraduate opportunity here, uh, a couple of thoughts and some of the others can, can speak to it as well. First of all, pre-med is not really a degree. Um, it is a pathway. And, and uh, really, so, you know, to think about what sort of degree uh, you want to pursue and, and to recognize that it doesn't have to be in science necessarily either. Um, that certainly uh, it can be, there of course are the science prerequisites you need to take, but, but it can be in almost any field of interest. And, and often many of our medical students do have uh, degrees outside of uh, science fields or at least minors outside of, uh, uh, or double majors outside of that. Um, so having a wide array of opportunities for, for uh, pursuing degrees uh, is certainly a critical part of that. Um, we have obviously because of our connections to the medical center and, and, and uh, the university and we're located about 35 miles away and Lawrence is about 35 miles away from the medical school, a trip that I make uh, at least weekly, if not more often, uh, even in a pandemic. Um, it's, it's a pretty easy shot to be able to get a great hands-on experience there as well. Um, and, and I don't know, Rob, uh, you or, or Dean Ojo can speak to it, but I think roughly about a third of the class of uh, your medical school comes from KU. 
And, yeah. and I think that's a, a reflection of that relationship and that connectivity between our uh, uh, the undergraduate programs. Um, and so it's a, it's a great way to position yourself strategically for, for that. Um, we have a great pre-med society that's very active. We help with uh, the MCAT prep materials and mock interviews and just have a lot of uh, 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 resources to bring to bear for our students as they think about preparing for a career in medicine. Um, but we also have a world-class honors program. Uh, one of the top five in the country. And, and that's a community within a community. It's a community of about 1,400 students here uh, that uh, are headed into all different fields, but certainly a, a large contingent of those have an interest in medicine as well. Um, and that Honors College is, is definitely something worth looking into and the resources it brings to bear, as well as the additional seminars and uh, small group activities. It's, it's just really it is truly a world-class uh, enterprise. And I would encourage you to look into that as well. Uh, about a third of our students do study abroad. And I think, uh, you know, as I think about uh, over my years of, of medicine, of, as we've looked at applicants, you know, very well-rounded people is one of those things that, that medical schools are looking for and experienced people and study abroad is certainly one of those experiences that can help you develop that. Uh, undergraduate research can be critically important as well. And we have uh, about a third of our student body does that as well. And we have great opportunities for that undergraduate research uh, here. So, um, um, and, and we have uh, a great enterprise around uh, entrepreneurship and innovation in, in ways we actually have students that have started their own companies while they've been here. So, uh, and I know the medical center is, is very engaged in that activity as well. So uh, gaining some of those skills as an undergrad can, can serve you very well as you head into a career of medicine and think about uh, uh, what aspects you might even be able to take into a commercialized environment there. So I think really no matter what your interests are in terms of, of field of interest, uh, Katie, is a great place for that. I know that we have great infrastructure to help prepare you for a, a, a career in medicine, and we have a great partner at the Medical Center and the University of Kansas Health System to help create those opportunities even while you're here as an undergraduate. Uh, so we're great, uh, very excited to have you here tonight to, to explore this opportunity with us, and, and uh, congratulations on your achievements so far. And, and we know that you will, are driven to continue that success as you move into the next step of, as, of your career. Um, so I think I will pause here, Lisa, and maybe introduce our executive vice chancellor, if I might, uh, Dr. Robert Samari. And Dr. Samari is uh, the current executive vice chancellor at KU Medical Center. He's, he uh, uh, succeeded me in, in that role and oversees the School of Medicine, but also the schools of nursing, health professions, the entire research enterprise, the cancer center, uh, and, and works uh, very closely with the University of Kansas Health System. Uh, he also happens to be a KU uh, School of Medicine alumni. Um, and Rob, are you the first alum to, to serve in that role? You might actually was be the first day. first alum to serve as dean. I, there you I, go. I'm not 100 percent sure about vice chancellor Doug. You have to we'll have, have to look into really, that one. You have to look into that. Thank thank you very much, Doug. I'm gonna uh, I'm gonna make a few comments about uh, why I think medical school is a great direction for you. Um, you the, if you've chosen to be here tonight, you represent some of the best and brightest students across the country. I'm sure you're curious. I'm sure you're good at math and science, and I'm sure you uh, have a degree of ambition that will uh, serve you well. In the country, the state, the cities, we all, we all need uh, more uh, doctors, particularly uh, that's been highlighted throughout this pandemic. I'd just like to spend uh, uh, two minutes uh, sharing with you the pathways that medical school can bring. So if, if you think about a pyramid, if you think about a pyramid and you think about our alumni filling that pyramid, the base of the pyramid are the primary care specialists. We're very proud of training outstanding primary care uh, doctors, actually, as well as nurses and health professionals, whether that be in family medicine, internal medicine, pediatrics, OBGYN, surgery. The primary care specialists represent most of our alumni. On top of that would be the specialists. I'm a cardiologist. I graduated from the School of Medicine in 1986. Uh, and on top of that would be even fewer subspecialists, such as Dr. Gerard, an, uh, an otolaryngologist who's a cancer surgeon. So we train wonderful uh, subspecialists in all areas. On top of that would be those who stay in, in academic settings, the teachers, the professors at medical schools across the country. And just two notable, uh, uh, two, two individuals to note, um, one of the world's greatest coronavirologists, 
um, Dr. Mark Dennison at Vanderbilt University was a KU undergrad and a KU medical school graduate, went to Shawnee Mission South, and he really was the guy that developed remdesivir for, corona, uh, for coronavirus and started just where you're sitting today with an interest in his KU undergraduate. Barney Graham, similarly from Gardner, uh, was, is the developer of the Moderna vaccine for coronavirus. Again, a KU undergraduate and a KU medical school graduate who's now at the NIH. And then on the top, the very top of that pyramid would be the unusual but fascinating array of, of careers that can come out of medicine, medical school. You've just seen one, Dr. Gerard, university president, probably one of, Doug, what would you say, maybe eight university presidents who are MDs, do you think? Uh, seven or eight, I'd have to check. It changes week by week. <laughs> yeah, so, so seven or eight uh, who have become university presidents. Obviously, there are a number of deans and CEOs of hospital, executive vice chancellors like myself, uh, what about Governor? Governor Collier was a classmate of mine, class of 1986. What about a United States Senator? Uh, Senator-elect Roger Marshall was the class of 1987. What about county health leaders? Uh, these are people who are at the very top of the pyramid who are caring for folks throughout the state, including uh, Dr. Greiner and Dr. Corvo in, in Wyandotte County. Dr. Lamaster in Johnson County, Dr. Minns in Wyandotte County. And then, there's, then there are these very uh, interesting careers. Uh, Michael Crichton, the writer of Jurassic Park, was a Harvard Medical School graduate. Robin Cook, who wrote Coma, was a medical school graduate. The point of saying all this is, yes, it is true that our goal is to generate doctors for the state of Kansas. And many of those are, we're very proud of primary care students primary care doctors and specialists and subspecialists, but medical school has such a wide range of opportunities um, and uh, the sky's the limit. And matter of fact, space is the limit with a number of, uh, a number of astronauts who have been MDs. So I, I just want to welcome you here tonight, say, tell you that medical school is a, director, a direction that is, uh, uh, is incredibly exciting, keeps a number of uh, diverse careers in the offing and we would be uh, very uh, delighted if you had a greater interest in the School of Medicine in Kansas and, 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 and did so following a time at the university as an undergraduate. And with that being said, I'm gonna introduce again, another person a bit at the top of the pyramid, Dr. the Executive Dean Akinlolu Ojo. And Dean Ojo has been in place for about 18 months. Uh, Dean Ojo's uh, background is, uh, through internal medicine and nephrology. He's a, a native of uh, Africa, but, uh, and has continued to study uh, kidney disease in the continent of Africa. We've been delighted to recruit him from the University of Arizona. So I'm gonna turn it over to the Executive Dean of the University of Kansas School of Medicine, Dean Ojo. Thank you very much, Executive Vice Chancellor Simari. I also want to add my welcome to dad of Chancellor Giraud and Vice Chancellor Simari to you this evening and to thank you for participating in this program. I want to take a few minutes to share with you some of the unique features of our medical school education program here at KU School of Medicine. At the center of everything that we do at the KU School of Medicine is our mission. And our mission is to improve lives and communities in Kansas and beyond through innovation in education, in research, and in healthcare. A faculty of over 1,300 at this medical school, hundreds of staff, and our student body take great pride in the fact that KU School of Medicine offers an innovative medical education that will prepare physicians, including yourself, if you come to KU School of Medicine, to be well equipped to practice medicine in the 21st century. Since the founding of this school in 
1905, providing our students with cutting edge education has been at the core of our mission and we carry on that tradition with pride. And as Executive Vice Chancellor Simari noted in his comments, our primary goal is to train physicians for the state of Kansas. And we train the largest fraction of our physicians to be primary care physicians in Kansas. And as Dr. Simari also pointed out, we also train physicians who have become for, at the forefront of research in the world, forefront of educational leadership, school leadership and administration, and across the field of science and uh, social sciences at different stages of the careers of those individuals. Here at KU School of Medicine, we offer one outstanding MD program, one single curriculum on three different medical school campuses. Kansas City is home to the main campus and welcomes about 175 new students to each new class. The school shares a campus with School of Nursing, a School of Health Professions, multiple graduate programs and a large academic tertiary hospital. Our Wichita Regional Campus admits 28 students to each new medical school class. The school in Wichita shares a campus with the KU School of Pharmacy and is affiliated with two large hospitals in close proximity in Wichita. Our Salina Regional Campus accepts eight students to each new medical school class. It shares a campus with the School of Nursing and is also affiliated with the regional hospital. Students who matriculate into a track in which uh, they can choose to spend two years at the Kansas City campus may also elect to spend two years at the Wichita campus. In fact, 44 students every year choose to sp split their medical education with the first two years in Kansas City campus and to the last two years in Wichita. Students from all three campuses receive the same outstanding medical education. If you matriculate into the KU School of Medicine, you will benefit from a new curriculum that we call the ACE curriculum that was rolled out under Executive Vice Chancellor Simari in 2017 when he was the Executive Dean. The acronym ACE stands for Active Learning. That is A. C stands for Competency-Based and E for Excellence-Driven. The ACE curriculum has been noted as one of the four most transformative medical school curriculum in the United States today. The curriculum integrates foundational and clinical sciences so that the content of the medical education is presented in an applicable context from day one and the foundational science concept continues throughout the clinical training years. As you explore medical school as a choice for yourself and think about a career in medicine, you will find the KU School of Medicine to be among the best for medical education program that will lay the foundation for you to practice any type of medicine and pursue any vocation or professional direction that you may want to pursue. I want to wish you the best as you embark on your own educational journeys. And I hope to see you again in the future. Thank you. Thank you so much for all of your great remarks. We greatly appreciate it. We are now going to turn it over to Dr. David Becker. He's an assistant professor and he at the School of Medicine and he's gonna go over 
preparing for medical school. So Dr. Becker, it's all, it's your turn. So thank you. All right, thanks Lisa and Amy. Um, are those slides up? I can't tell if, uh, if I can see them. Yes, they're up. All right, let me just move something around and we'll get to it. Um, thanks for the opportunity, gang, uh, for letting me talk to you. There were three uh, pretty um, amazing people that just talked before me, and um, now you're stuck with me now, so sorry about that. Um, but I'm going to go over a little bit of what they talked about um, and then build on what to do um, and what to think about in your position now in high school. So um, um, as you probably uh, know, uh, an MD program is um, mo most typically four years. It follows your bachelor's degree at a, a traditional comp uh, college campus. K, um, KU School of Medicine has three different campuses, as was mentioned, um, and it, our curriculum is essentially split into two halves. One is more fu uh, foundational sciences, um, where you have in-depth biochemistry and, bio and physiology, uh, anatomy, um, things like that. And then the second half, or the last two years, is more clinical science, where you're actually going and, and uh, implementing the sciences that you've learned and into patient care. We teach a lot um, through different ways that you guys as um, up and coming students uh, know probably better than a lot of the faculty did at least three years ago before ACE started, uh, things like flipped classrooms and problem-based learning. Um, we have a um, mostly small group um, a curriculum um, where a lot of teaching happens um, between um, students and colleagues as well as faculty that are trained um, and, and the different domains that you're learning about and also to help cultivate uh, a team environment. Um, after medical school, you'll have anywhere from three to eight or even more years of training uh, to become what kind of a type of physician you wish to be. Um, I myself am an internist by training. So um, I had four years of undergrad, four years at um, med school, and three years of internal medicine training for 11 years after high school. So those of you that are juniors, um, you're about halfway done with your training. Um, other folks like Dean Samari uh, had uh, three years of, of um, or sorry, Executive Vice Chancellor uh, Samari, sorry about that, had three years of cardiology fellowship and then another um, uh, year or two of training um, to become an interventional cardiologist. So you can see how that training adds up. Um, next slide, Amy. And then I don't know, I can't, I still can't see if they're coming. So um, I'll say that and then we'll go from there. All right, so in high school, where you're at now, um, things that you'll wanna think about are um, taking courses that will help prepare you for uh, college. Uh, so math and science courses at, at high levels that demand and push you would be um, um, something to think about. And also things like biology, chemistry, physics um, um, would um, be helpful. Um, and then take other courses that will help prepare you for college. So things like public speaking, which I'm not doing very well now, or English um, or, um, or writing would be things to do. Um, but ultimately in high school, you need to really work on developing great study uh, skills and then getting opportunities to help find out what you wanna do. Um, I, to this day, like to work um, um, with tools and, and, and create things uh, with wood. Uh, so shop class was one of my favorite things in high school and something that I don't regret at all. So still do things that you have interest in um, that will help make you a, a well-rounded person. Okay, next slide. All right, so when you uh, decide um, it's time to go to college um, and you think that you wanna to go to medical school, you need to think about um, a college that will have uh, strong sciences um, that would help um, propel you to have the best chance for uh, success at the MCAT, or which is essentially the ACT or ACT to help get into med school, as well as give you all the skills you need to um, succeed in your um, med school courses. Um, so that should be something that you think about as you're deciding what college to go to. After that, you need to decide um, what college fits for you. I know we're at the KU um, event night tonight and I myself am Jayhawk. I graduated from high school in 1997 from Tonganoxie. I went to Lawrence for undergrad then stayed four years in Kansas City for med school and then my residency here and, and have worked here for over a dozen years as faculty. I've been at KU well over half my life. But that doesn't mean KU is gonna be the right fit for every person that wants to go to medical school. Um, um, and that's okay. Uh, things to think about as you're selecting your college are you know, the academic profile, what kind of social scene um, that you want, how much it costs, that matters, right? Um, you know, what scholarship situations happen. And also geographic, where you live now, where you wanna live in the future. Um, some people like large schools like KU, 
Um, others want small schools. Um, and then also private versus public, uh, maybe a residential uh, school like KU would be or a commuter school like UMKC, for instance, where you maybe would live at home. Also, don't be afraid of uh, thinking about junior college as a, a way to propel um, your academic career before you go into a traditional four-year school to finish your degree. Um, there will be uh, prerequisites for almost any med school that you want to go to, what, um, but um, um, you don't have to pick a major. Um, like the, uh, uh, Dr. Gerard mentioned, um, um, you can major in anything. It doesn't have to be biology, um, Spanish, or uh, other foreign languages, art, um, English, um, engineering. Those are all majors that are common that we uh, see and discuss as we're talking about uh, applicants to med school. All right, next slide. Um, so things that you could be thinking about now are what kind of experiences that you wanna do to help solidify um, this is something that you wanna do um, um, for your career um, and that it's something that um, um, gives you uh, hope for your fellow person as well as fulfills you. So things to think about are um, things to be involved with service to others, working um, and getting gaining experience in healthcare to make sure that's the right thing that you wanna go into and then um, getting exposures to physicians and seeing the day-to-day -day job. So the next slide, um, service to others, physicians above all else are um, um, servants. Um, we help people in their time of need. We help people um, um, from going into a time of need uh, through preventative care, things like that. Um, so um, things that we would look for on the admissions committee as far as someone that would be a good um, uh, addition to our med school class are um, our altruism, how folks give back um, to their communities. Um, and we look at things that would develop leadership and time management skills, as all well as um, um, a longitudinal thing that shows that you have a passion for what you're doing. Now, that doesn't mean you just have to volunteer um, at the local emergency department. Um, you can do whatever you want, whatever makes your, your heart happy and that you're helping your fellow person. Um, so things like Habitat for Humanity or um, um, a, a local um, 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 dog shelter or um, um, a domestic violence shelter, whatever makes um, you um, um, feel fulfilled and that you're helping your fellow person. Um, what we do look for is that um, you're able to take those experiences and, and parlay them into what would make you a good physician as well as, um, <clears throat> well, that's good enough. All right, next slide. Um, so you do probably need to get some healthcare experiences to know that this is the job that you want to do. Um, so places that you can volunteer or work would be fantastic. I did mention before, you don't just have to volunteer at your local emergency department, but that's a great place to break the uh, ice and meet people um, and find out people to shadow, things like that. Um, when you're also getting healthcare um, experience, you want to look at the different roles in healthcare. There's a lot more uh, jobs than just a physician um, that go into helping take care of a patient. Things like um, nursing or physical therapy or occupational therapy or even um, healthcare administration. Those are all things that ultimately go to the goal of, of making the patient's life better. Um, as you're gaining this experience, uh, just don't look at how this experience is helping shape you, but also uh, think critically about your activity. So uh, be able to think about how the current issues in healthcare are being impacted by the experiences you're doing and what are potential changes or, or thoughts that you have on ways to make things better. All right, uh, next slide. Um, ways that you can get experience and roles um, that you can um, um, see this interdisciplinary uh, interdisciplinary um, uh, roles at work would be to get a CNA um, and that stands for certified nursing assistant. You may also see, see things like a CMA, certified medical assistant. Those are folks that help um, um, patients either in the hospital or nursing facilities or in emergency rooms um, um, with things like toiletry or, or um, uh, um, uh, getting meals, stuff like that. Phlebotomists, those are folks that help get blood uh, samples, um, is a good way to get patient exposures and medical exposure as well. Uh, working on a unit, helping stock shelves and, and uh, work on paperwork is a great way um, to get experience. That whole list is there. Um, um, but you can see on that list that it's not just um, um, medicine, uh, sorry, physicians that you are gonna be with. You, uh, anything in healthcare would be a good way to get these exposures. 
All right, next slide. Finally, you probably will want to do some shadowing um, in your medical and your undergrad career. Um, that will give you access to uh, direct patient care and then being able to talk to a physician how they're thinking through the problems that she's seen with the patient at that time. Um, so good ways to figure out who to shadow would be um, talking to uh, your primary care physician, whether that's your family medicine provider or internist or even your pediatrician. Um, if you're from a smaller town, other physicians in the community uh, would be good ones to go to. Um, also in college, talking to your uh, um, uh, academic advisor or your pre-med advisor about finding, finding out who other um, uh, pre-med students have shadowed in the past. Those may be good opportunities. Now, I will mention that COVID makes all this a little bit more difficult, um, rightly so, where um, physicians are trying to limit the number of people that are in clinics uh, to keep um, uh, the population as a whole at, uh, as safe as possible and, and still providing the quality care that we need to for our patients at their time of need. Um, so that means um, maybe being creative in how you ask or seek um, these shadowing experiences may be something to think about. Um, but a lot of clinics are moving to Zoom appointments, and that's a good way where you potentially still get involved. Um, um, so, um, yeah, that's about that one. All right, next slide. So after you've done all these experiences, whether it be helping in the community or getting medical exposures or shadowing with a physician, you'll probably wanna jot down a couple of your thoughts from that day, whether something that was really good or something that really didn't work out so well, something that was fantastic and makes you excited to go and, and do that event the next time it comes around, or maybe something that, you know what, um, uh, that wasn't the best for me. Those are all important um, uh, milestones in your growth to decide what you want for a career and journaling will help you uh, put all those thoughts together and then have, be a resource for you as you're circling around to make your med school applications to help you write your um, personal statement as well as um, your uh, feelings about your different activities. All right, so um, next slide. And really briefly, I think you guys have this in your brochure, uh, but essentially KU School of Medicine between our three campuses has 211 students every year, eight of which um, every year spend all four years in Salina, uh, 28 of which uh, spend all four years in Wichita, 125 roughly spend all four years in Kansas City, and then another 45 to 50 folks um, spend half their, their first two years in Kansas City and then their clinical years in Wichita. Um, so that's our class size and how it's all broken down. For the most part, um, our, app, uh, our med students uh, at KU School of Medicine are from Kansas. Um, so um, we're a state institution and that's kind of why. But that doesn't mean um, those of you from Texas and Illinois and Colorado and Oklahoma and God forbid, even Missouri, because um, um, you know I'm a Jayhawk, um, um, can't get into School of Medicine here. One way to help get that Kansas tie is to go to an undergrad institution in the state of Kansas. And of course, KU Lawrence is one of those. Uh, so that maybe give you um, some insight on, on if you wanna end up at KU School of Medicine uh, for your medical school career, how to help that happen. Um, just by the numbers, our average science GPA uh, in college is about a 3.74. Um, and our MCAT scores are uh, roughly 510 or 511. Um, and that's about the 80th percentile for MCAT takers. Uh, there's not really a clear correlation between ACT, SAT, and MCATs. Um, but um, um, a good rule of thumb is maybe that's probably about a ACT of around 29 or 30. That's just kind of a guess, though, um, because there are different populations and different tests. Um, and as has been previously mentioned a few times now, you don't just have to major in biology. We have over 38 majors um, in the last class uh, from our 201, uh, 211 sorry, applicants. So you can major, major in whatever makes your heart happy, as long as you're getting the prerequisites and are qualified academically, and you're showing service for others and have medical exposures, you'd be a good candidate for um, KU School of Medicine. All right, so uh, Jason Edwards, next slide, is our go-to for pre-med programs, and he can help answer questions. Um, and um, I'll be around later in the Q&A session, um, too, uh, if any questions pop up. Thanks for your time. Thank you so much, Dr. Becker. That was very informative. So next up, we have Grace Gomez. She's the pre-health outreach coordinator here on the Lawrence campus, and she's going to share some tips if you were on the pre-med pathway as a student at the University of Kansas. So Grace, I'm gonna turn it over to you. 
Great, thank you, Lisa. Hi, everyone. So I might be a familiar face to some of you and others, I might be a stranger. So my name is Grace Gomez and I work with students who are thinking about coming to KU to study one of our pre-health pathways. So obviously tonight we are talking about pre-med. So that's what I'm going to primarily be focusing on. So when we talk about what the pre-med experience looks like at KU, we really break it down into two areas. So there are the academics and the experiences. Um, so when it comes to academics, there is a curriculum that you need to follow. We'll go to the next slide. Um, and really, it kind of consists of these foundation courses and then additional courses that you need to take. So for your foundation courses, that includes things like two semesters of biology, two semesters of physics, three to four semesters of chemistry. So these are pretty typical just across the board, regardless of which university you go to. Uh, but you will be tested on these for the MCAT. So that is why we want you to take these. Uh, other courses that you might take uh, include things like anatomy, uh, mammalian physiology, microbiology, biochemistry, all that great stuff. And you will take these because one, some of them you might be tested on for the MCAT, like I mentioned, and then other ones, um, you might not necessarily be tested on them. However, you will, uh, or they will be required based on the medical schools that you are uh, thinking about applying to. So biochemistry um, and microbiology, anatomy, there are other recommended courses like immunology and everything um, that we try to fit in if at all possible. Um, so really, I think the most important thing that you all should take away from tonight is probably this note on math that I have coming up um, on the next slide. So uh, when you come to KU, if you decide to come to KU for your undergrad, uh, really the main piece that I think you all need to know if you don't remember anything else from tonight, um, and you can screenshot this slide if you want, but to start in biology one and chemistry one, when you get to KU, you need to have either a 26 math ACT, um, if you took the SAT, that is a 610 on the math portion of the SAT, or credit for college algebra or an AP calculus score of three are higher. I mostly bring this up for planning purposes for you all because I do have students ask, uh, you know, what classes should I be taking now? I'm thinking about taking college algebra or I might take the AP Calc exam. I don't know. Or maybe you are retaking the ACT or the SAT coming up in December. So now you know that these are things that you have to shoot for. But I will also say um, and clarify that there are plenty of students who don't come in with any of these things. And that's totally fine. What happens is they start in college algebra their first semester when they get Get to KU and then their second semester is when they start in biology and chemistry and they graduate on fine and everything is just fine so um, but something I just wanted to point out to you like I said for planning purposes now the last part of the academics is your major and I think uh, this was emphasized pretty well by the Chancellor and Dr. Becker uh, but you can major in anything you know we really want you to do something that you're passionate about and the reason why is because when you do something you, that you're actually invested in that you truly care about it reflects better academically on your GPA. Now your GPA when you're applying to med school is not the entire process. It's not the whole thing. And um, they're going to be looking at several different aspects of your application. But having a good GPA, good MCAT score is something that can really help to get your foot in the door. Um, so as far as your major, major goes, we do have a lot of biology majors, I'm not going to lie. But we also see students uh, major in other things like dance and Spanish are really, really common majors as well. Uh, things like psychology and sociology are also really popular. Um, one last tidbit about your major that I do want to mention is that uh, so you your advisor is going to be your major advisor. So if you are majoring in English, you will have an English advisor and that advisor will still be able to talk to you about all of your pre-med things. So don't worry about it. Uh, but I just bring that up because it is a question that I do get asked about a lot. And I just want to clarify that for some of you. So yeah, um, the next part that of the pre-med experience is um, you know, your shadowing and healthcare activities and general service and involvement. I think Dr. Becker, Becker covered that pretty dang well, uh, but I do want to add just a quick few things on to, uh, there. Um, so when it comes to your experiences, not just for these three, these three, but your experiences in general, it's really about pushing yourself outside of your comfort zone and being able to figure out what you like and what you don't like. You know, you may think that you like something and then you experience something else. Um, and so that's what it's really about is 
getting those range of experiences. Um, I think shadowing is a really good example of this because we want you to get a whole bunch of different shadowing experiences in different environments. You know, we have some students who go into the hospital setting and they shadow there and they're like, I don't like this. I don't know if this is the right path for me. Uh, do I want to do pre-med? And so it starts this kind of panicking motion with them. Um, but then they go and they shadow in a smaller uh, clinic and it could be a clinic that is in town. It could be a family owned clinic in a rural area, but they figure out that is much more their pace. That is something that they like to do. Yes, they still want to go to medical school. Um, so that's why I really bring that up is getting that range of experiences in those different areas. And now something that I do want to talk about is our proximity to Topeka and uh, Kansas City with the Medical Center campus. So we're really, really lucky um, at Lawrence to be in the center between those. Um, and so our students uh, really take advantage of it. So just to give a few examples of places where our students volunteer and shadow at and then get jobs at. You know, in Lawrence, we have the Lawrence Memorial Hospital. They uh, now have a place out west, which is super cool. There's the Harlan Community Health Clinic. There's the Lawrence Medical Services Branch for the community shelter. Um, all those three uh, places serve different populations. So those are already three that you can count on um, if that's something that you'd be interested in. Uh, Topeka, we obviously have Stormont Vale and the St. Francis campus. They have very, very robust volunteer and work programs. So that one is super nice. And then obviously in Kansas City, we have the Medical Center campus. It's our full functioning research hospital, but it also houses the School of Medicine, um, obviously, School of Nursing and School of Health Professions. Now, one thing that I do want to point out that I'm sure one of the students will mention is the JDOC Free Clinic, which is a super cool opportunity um, for our undergrad students to go up and volunteer with uh, the med school students who are running the JDOC Free Clinics. Um, so that's a cool experience to hear their own stories and learn from them and see how they're going about um, and doing everything. So that is one of the nice things. Um, I will also point out though that yes, it's nice that we have these three uh, large cities to choose from for all of your different experiences. But I will also point out that we have do we are we do have smaller communities like Congonancy, Dora Valley Falls um, that do have their own uh, health clinics and health systems that you can go into and uh, volunteer and shadow at and everything. Uh, so yes. Uh, the next thing that I want to touch on, I'm trying to go fast for time here uh, so that we can get to the Q&A, but the main thing I want to touch on here is um, what I like to call alternative pathways to getting healthcare experiences. So things that you might not necessarily think would count, but absolutely do when you are applying to med school. So I think the first and probably most important thing is getting involved in student groups. You will hear this whether you are at KU or at another institution that you should get involved in student groups, but you might be like, why? Why should I even care? about that? Well, you should care because if we're, for your pre-health student groups, your pre-med student groups, a lot of them, one, they're great peer support networks. So there are going to be people who are your age who are going through the same things as you. You know, your roommates might be majoring in all these different things, uh, but it's nice to have people who are in these student groups who are doing it with you and that you can study with and form study groups and everything um, and talk about tests together and your homework. You might end up getting a lab partner out of it. Um, another great reason is that they're super awesome uh, professional development networks. So a lot of our pre-L student groups, which by the way, we have over 20 different health-based student groups at KU, a lot of them really focus on professional development. And so they bring in alumni, both from the med school and the undergraduate level who went to other med schools to come in and to talk to you about their own experiences. They bring in uh, local folks to uh, talk to you about shadowing and volunteer opportunities. And what are different research and internship opportunities that you can get out of this? So so if you're wondering, how do I even get all this stuff? A pre-L student group is a great, great place to start. Um, and that definitely something that we want you to take advantage of because we had students get internships, um, even recommendation letters from admissions board members come out of it. So that's why we want you to join pre-health student groups. Uh, the next piece that I wanna kind of chat about, oh, sorry, go back, Amy. <laughs> uh, is a uh, study abroad. So I bring up study abroad because uh, it's a great cross-cultural competency piece. You might not be thinking about it, but um, you're gonna be working with many different people from several different backgrounds, uh, and you need to be able to understand how to problem solve and uh, gain your adaptability skills to be able to talk to all these different folks that you'll be interacting with. And so we found that students who have this study abroad experience um, is really beneficial to them. So there's so many different opportunities that you can have for the sake of time. I will uh, kind of move on to the research part, but for research, uh, uh, 
uh, something that some of you might be interested in hearing about, but uh, research is something that we recommend you get involved in KU. You will be involved in it regardless um, if you decide to take part in it outside of the classroom, but it is something that we emphasize because it is an applied science. And when you go to medical school, that applied science is used uh, throughout the uh, your time at medical school. And so students who have research experience not only has it elevated their application, but then we found that when they've gotten into their programs, uh, they're just a step ahead of their peers who don't have research experience. Now, when it comes to health-based research, there's a lot of different options that you have. We do have the natural sciences that our biology and our chemistry department focus on. They do a lot of different cool things from biomedical engineering to genome sequencing. There's even COVID research going on at the Lawrence campus. Uh, so all this is at the Lawrence campus. But there's also health, other health-based research, like the School of Journalism has a center for underserved populations. Um, and they study uh, how access to healthcare affects Kansas populations. They make recommendations recommendations to local cities and even the state officials and everything. Uh, so you have a lot of those options here at KU. Uh, for the sake of time, I will kind of wrap it up and move on to the timeline. I know this is something that some of you are interested in, uh, but you can go ahead and take a screenshot of this. Uh, like I said, uh, I think the presentation might be sent out um, and some other materials as well. So you don't have to worry if you don't get a screenshot of this, uh, but just kind of in general, if you're thinking about going uh, straight through to medical school. Usually our students uh, apply the summer between their junior and their senior year. So that is when you apply and then all of your your the entirety of your junior year, your third year is when you are studying for the MCAT, preparing your application materials, all that good stuff. The fall of your fourth, fourth year is when you do your interviews um, and then you get your acceptance letters and then graduate in the spring. So that was kind of a quick rendition, uh, but I will also be around to answer any questions that you may have. So I will go ahead and hand it back to Lisa. Thank you so much. And again, really wonderful information for students as they prepare for college. So thank you, great, wonderful. So next up, and thank you all so much. We hope you have been finding this information valuable and thanks for staying on um, throughout the hour so far. We next have this wonderful faculty and student um, question and answer panel. And so this is an opportunity for all the prospective students on tonight to ask questions in the chat. And I'll be watching the chat and asking that to the panel. And so what we're gonna start off with is having the, all the different faculty and students who are participating in the panel tonight to introduce themselves quickly in the order listed here on the slide. And then I'll kick off with the first question. And then students, we hope that you will add questions to the chat. And if not, I have some other questions I can ask the panel as well. But this is a great opportunity for you to ask any of those questions that you've been wondering about, or even if things have just sparked your interest tonight, um, as you've heard from all the different speakers um, that we have had join us this evening. So Dr. Becker, I'm going to turn it back over to you. All right. Hey, gang, again, Dave Becker, Internal Medicine. Uh, I'm this year's chair of the admissions committee for the School of Medicine, and I've been on that selection committee for about the last eight or 10 years or something like that. Dr. Kaleo. Hi, my name is James Kaleo. I'm the associate dean for research on the Wichita campus of the School of Medicine. Like most of uh, our faculty, we wear many hats. I also direct the honors and enrichment program. I'm also the associate chairman for research in the Department of Internal Medicine and the Internal Medicine Residency Program. And I'd be remiss to, since this is an admissions event, uh, I co-created a program called Scholars in Rural Health. I, I've stepped back as the director, but Dr. Becker came through that program and uh, Hannah Berlin, who you'll meet, came through that program. And it's ably administered by Brian Steele, who you'll meet next. Glad you're here. Yes, I'm Brian Steele. I'm the Assistant Dean for Admissions at the School of Medicine. Um, if you have any admissions related questions, uh, definitely feel free to ask me. But like Dr. Becker said, he is our chair of admissions committee, and Dr. Coyle is also on that committee. So they also have a lot of good perspective as well as what we're looking for on applicants. Uh, and then also the current students, they have great uh, insight on what we look for. But thank you all for being here today. Hi, my name is Hannah Berland. I am a M2 on the Salina campus. Um, I'm from DeMar, Kansas. It's a real small town, about an hour north of Hayes, um, way up northwest Kansas. 
Um, and I graduated high school in 2015, so I'm not that much older than you guys. Um, I got a degree in human biology from KU in 2019 and loved being a Jayhawk. I just wanted to keep doing it. Hi, I'm Ebony Anyala. I'm an M3 at the KC campus. Sorry for my attire. Literally just got out of surgery like 20 minutes ago. Um, I went to KU for undergrad. Um, here, obviously, K for med school, and I'm from Wichita, Kansas. And I majored at biology in Lawrence, KU. Hi, I'm Zaina Zaya. I'm a third year on the Wichita campus. Um, I actually did the two and two program. So I started on Kansas City, and now I'm in Wichita. And I was born and raised in Wichita, Kansas, went to San Antonio for college, and then came back, missed Kansas. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. Yes, especially for those who have just come straight from work. So thank you to both of you. And so I'm gonna kick off with the first question and we already have a lot of great questions in the chat. So we will try to get to as many as we can. If I don't say yours out loud, we will, try, we will be answering them in the chat as well. So you might look there for some of them. Some of them will answer directly in the chat. But for the students that are on, can you let us know, or anyone that, um, just anyone, anyone on the panel that, why did why did you choose KU um, School of Medicine, and did you always want to pursue a career in medicine? I know for me, the reason I chose KU is that I went out of state for college, and I realized that there is such a community aspect of Kansas that people tend to overlook. Mostly being born and raised here, it's something that I never knew there's any difference of, and I could tell the difference. So I wanted to come back. Um, I did not know I always wanted to pursue a career in medicine. In college, I was between a PhD and an MD route, and I ended up picking the MD route because I did research, and I loved what I did, but it was not something that I could see myself doing for the rest of my life. I can go next. Um, I grew up a lifelong Jayhawk, and I knew that I wanted to do medicine. Um, I worked as a CNA when I was in high school and um, really got involved in healthcare kind of early on and knew that that was something I wanted to pursue. And so not only did I love KU, but I knew that KU was gonna provide me with a really strong um, science background. I knew there was research opportunities, honors, everything that everyone has talked about thus far um, was just right up my alley. And I, um, it really, it worked out great, so. Okay, let's go ahead and get started with some of these questions in the chat. I'll do my best to cover as many of them as I can. There are several different questions and so um, about being admitted into KU Medical School. And so I don't know if Dr. Becker or um, who else wants to take these, but it's a lot of questions about does KU Medical School prefer KU over other Kansas colleges and universities? And just in general, like just kind of the preference there of where you yeah. With your undergraduate, there's yeah, several I'll, questions along those lines. I'll jump along that. Um, no, there's no particular preference for um, KU students uh, for the KU School of Medicine compared to any other school. Um, what is the preference is that you have a strong Kansas tie or you're a Kansas resident. Um, so if you're not from Kansas, um, how you get a Kansas tie would essentially be um, going to a uh, um, undergrad institution in the state of Kansas. Um, I think uh, Dean Samari, Dean, uh, and um, I keep calling him Dean uh, Samari, Dr. Samari and Gerard had mentioned about a third of our class comes from KU and that's true, but quite honestly, probably another third comes from K-State as well. Those are our two biggest uh, institutions, um, uh, undergrad institutions in the state. This is another really good question that we get asked a lot in admissions. What is the best way for a student to pursue their degree in the major that they want, but make sure they're taking the courses to be, be prepared for medical school and to be prepared to take the MCAT? I'll, I'll tackle that one. Um, so I, I think the best thing you can do is one, you're asking that question right now before you even start college. And so the best thing you can do is to reach out and find a good pre-med advisor even if you're a sign advisor and you don't think that they're doing a very good job advising you on how to get into medical school or take these classes, you need to reach out and find one that can really help you. And you need to start planning out these courses pretty early on. And so you have to think of it kind of in two lenses. What courses do I need to prepare me for medical school? Um, so those are prerequisite courses. You also think of what courses prepare me for the MCAT exam. 
So typically you're going to take the MCAT exam after your junior year of college, and you want to make sure you've taken the necessary courses for that before your junior year or during your junior year. So things like biochemistry, you could not wait to take biochemistry until after you take the MCAT. You need to take it well before you take the MCAT because that's one section on the MCAT. And biochemistry is not a course that we actually require for our prereqs. So the most important thing I'd say is reach out, find a pre-med advisor that's willing to work with you with your degree whether that's in your degree program or going outside of your degree program, that can really help you to line up your classes in appropriate order so you can you know, fill in all the things that you wanna do, um, make sure that you can do experiences over the summer, make sure you're taking the right classes that's gonna prepare you for the MCAT um, because you don't wanna save all those classes until your junior year, your senior year, and you're trying to take the MCAT and you're trying to apply for medical school all at the same time. That's really kind of a worst case scenario if you're trying to think, oh, if I'll take the MCAT while I'm taking biochemistry, while I'm taking all these other upper level science courses. So really reach out, find a good pre-med advisor that'll help you out kind of build up that schedule early on. That's great advice. And so the other question is, how many hours of shadowing should students be trying to do? And do they do that in high school and also in college? Or is, or is it more important for it to be done while they're in college as part of their application in medical school? Sure. Uh, I'll, t I'll tackle that. Uh, for the most part, we look at um, the admissions committee, uh, things, activities that you do in college or after, um, not necessarily high school now. Um, maybe some things that you're done, doing in high school that carry over into high school. I mean, carry over into college that would be looked on in some way, but we're not looking at high school GPA or ACT, SAT scores or high school activities. In general, you are looked at kind of on the last things that you've done. I think this is a good question for anyone who did their undergraduate at the University of Kansas. And it's, what is the medical technology like in the different classes? They're specifically saying like the, how realistic are the practice dummies and how realistic is the overall experience as uh, in during the undergraduate experience? Ebony, be careful when you answer this, you know who the director of that is. <laughs> the, are, is the question asking about in first and second year of medical school or undergraduate? I think I like got confused. I think I got that confused too. So let's go, it says pre-med, but I say go with either one. <laughs> That's cool. Cause I'm already dummies being in undergrad, but I will say not trying to like uh, brag for Dr. Becker, but the dummies um, in zeal and um, it's the clinical experiences in M1 and M2 um, before you actually go see like actual human patients um, are super interesting. I mean, they have someone in like a back room like talking and they can um, use their voice to like mimic, mimic um, physical exam findings. Um, they also can like turn color so they get blue if their like oxygen goes low. It's, it's super cool. And I know that not a lot of schools um, have the technology that KU um, School of Medicine does for um, the simulated experiences. Are there any special resources or people that you can talk to as you prepare for the MCAT? I think what I would say for that is honestly, um, upperclassmen, I found uh, just speaking with people that have been through the MCAT and have studied for it because it is a whole nother beast that you um, have, like I personally had never studied for a test like that. Um, maybe some people with the ACT, I don't know how, how much people study for the ACT these days, but um, I did not study for the ACT very much. And so the MCAT is kind of like a long process where you don't just study, you know, in a couple weeks before, or at least that's the, what you try to avoid. Um, and so having some people that have been through that process that can maybe recommend test prep companies or um, different resources that they used, and then also reaching out to pre-med advisors and people like Grace that can um, also kind of steer you through the right way to prepare. Dr. Clail, I see a question about um, um, what things, what um, kind of activities maybe preclude someone from getting to med school? Can you answer that in a different way of what kind of things you look for for someone getting to med school? Sure. Um, you know, there are several things that we evaluate besides your academics, your GPA and your MCAT. 
MCATs. Um, so we look at healthcare experiences and Dr. Becker went through a whole variety of healthcare experiences that uh, are appropriate, um, including work experiences, shadow experiences, volunteer experiences. We also believe that physicians should be caring and compassionate. It's not something you necessarily learn in medical school. It, it's just something who you are. And uh, so service activities, and again, Dr. Becker went through a, a whole bunch. Um, they can be school related, community-based, faith-based. Um, there, there's no one single type of service activity. I think those people that don't do a lot of that um, won't be evaluated as positively. So there's no checklist that you have to have five service experiences and two shadow experiences, uh, but you need enough to know what you're getting into and to show us that you're uh, not only qualified, but caring and compassionate. I think that answers that question. Thank you. There's been a lot of different questions, so I'll just kind of summarize it into one, but a lot of students are asking, um, how does specialization in medical school work? So at what point do they pick the area they want to specialize in? And several students have listed different areas that they want to, like they want to be a neurologist or they want to work um, in pediatrics. So like, how do they do that? And at what point? And then like, how does it extend after medical school? So if anyone wants to touch base, so there's quite a bit of those in there. So I don't know if we can just like- kind Yeah, of for sure. Generally, <laughs> so the first two years of med, uh, med school, you're just learning the sciences. The third year, you have a broad range of activities that will help you decide what kind of career path you want to go into, whether that be surgical or medical, adult uh, or child, um, uh, clinical or not. Like radiology would be one of the more, least uh, less uh, clinical rules. Um, and then in fourth year, you have more specialized experiences to help solidify that role. Roughly in September of your fourth year, uh, that's where you start to apply for residency positions. And through the winter, you do your um, interviews. And then on match day, which is roughly March 15th, that's the big day where every single med school student in the country uh, finds out where they're gonna go for their residency. Um, so you have um, up until the first part of your third, fourth year to figure out what kind of residency you wanna go into. That being said, if you get into your residency and decide I do not wanna be a neurologist anymore, um, I thought I liked it, but I'm here and I don't like it. And I instead wanna go do pediatrics. You can still switch into different residencies. That's not uncommon. I did that myself, um, um, but um, most people stay in what they start the residency in. Excellent. I like this question. What are your words of advice to be successful in med school? I would say that in med school, there's a lot of people that are gonna give you a lot of pieces of advice and it's helpful, but sometimes, you know, you're trying to, to please everyone and do what everyone else says. And, you know, someone said, do Anki or someone says, do this and that. And you're trying to do all of it. And you kind of have to, at some point, be able to absorb advice, but then also be able to say, that's great, that works for you, it's not gonna work for me. And that's something that I had to work on my first two years, mostly with our first board exam when it came up, is learning that other people learn differently than me and that's great for them, but I don't need to do everything that everyone's offered me. Probably a more broad um, take on that question, I would say is something that can apply to both med school and being successful in undergrad is to, um, and I know this is going to sound so cliche and corny, but really, truly like believe in yourself. Like you are like every, this, I know I already, I already want to like slap myself for being so cliche, but, um, it's, it's really true. Cause I, when I was in your shoes, go, go, going into high school, I totally thought like, this was not something I could do or that all my classmates were way smarter than me. And everybody was, you know, doing so much better in their pre-med courses or MCAT preparation or whatever. And it's really not true. And when you talk to people, everyone's struggling and everyone's going through the same things. And it's a real phenomenon. People, it's imposter syndrome, it's real. And it will follow you all the way up to med school. And I'm sure some of the upperclassmen could say like that it keeps going through M3 and M4 and <laughs> it just, it never ends. But so I think if you could start to kind of tackle that early on in your career and just start to work on that and you know, really truly honing that, um, taking the advice and you know, kind of, picking what you listen to and what you don't and just um, focusing on yourself and just always looking at the next hoop and keep working through and keep 
plugging away because right now it feels like med school is like a thousand years down the road, but you will blink and you will be a second year med student. Like it's, it's, it's insane how fast it goes by. Um, once again, I want to punch myself for being so cliche, but it really is true. Try to have that, um, work on that mentality early on is my biggest piece of advice. I might throw in even another question related to being successful. Um, what happens if you're struggling? Um, and, and I think everybody that gets into medical school is pretty smart and you're used to being at the top of your class and you're used to being successful. Um, but there are lots of resources if you run into trouble and use those resources. Um, we're, we're there to help you. There are people that are paid to help you. Uh, we want you to be successful. Um, so one way to be successful is to, if you find yourself struggling, get help. There's plenty of help available for you, regardless of what campus that you're on. Excellent, thank you for that. A lot of students have also been asking this, which is that question was like advice to be successful in medical school. This one is, I think, like more early on for them. Uh, they wanna know success to be admitted into medical school. Like what tips, like what tips would you get for the application process to get into medical school since it is so competitive? A lot of them have said it's so competitive to get in. How can I make myself stand out? And then another person asked, and kind of along the same lines, what are common reasons people are not accepted into medical school? And do students apply more than once to try to get in if they don't get in that first time? Yeah, for sure. So not everyone gets in the first time, um, and that's okay. Um, if you don't get in the first time, have you worked on ways to improve your application? Have you shown personal growth in whatever areas that you think may make you a better physician, whether it be in volunteering or or service or um, um, academics or whatever it might be. Um, so um, ways that people don't um, get in are probably come down to the interview doesn't go very well if their academics are okay. Um, so practicing an interview would be important with your advisor, with people that you trust and not people that would you trust just to have a good conversation with, but people that you trust to ask you um, probing questions um, that will make you think on your feet and, and maybe challenge something that you want to do. Uh, Dean Steele, you probably have some extra things to say on that as well. Uh, that's, you know, a really good point. I think I always tell students, you know, there's not one thing that'll get you into medical school, but there's definitely one thing that'll keep you out of medical school. And so whether that is a low MCAT score, a low GPA, a lack of experience, um, but I really think the biggest thing that really determines who's in medical school and not in medical school is communication. And so that's communication on your application and also communication in your interview. So you have to be able to effectively communicate why is medical school the right route for you? Why is a physician the right place for you? You have, to be, you have to do that with your words, but you also have to do that with your experiences. Um, as we talked about earlier, we also are looking, you know, not only what do you know about medicine, but what do you know about service to others? So do you have that on your application where you can back that up and talk about that, you know, effectively in an interview? Believe it or not, there's people with perfect MCAT scores, perfect GPAs that apply to medical school and are not in medical school. And a lot of that, I think, comes down to communication. So like Dr. Becker said, practice, practice, practice. If you are, you know, attending a university, in the, in the state of Kansas, so if you're at KU, you know if you have at least a 500 MCAT and a 3.2 GPA, a science GPA, you're going to be offered an interview. So don't wait until you get that invite to interview to start practicing for your interview. Start practicing right away. And so really think about why is this the right next step for me? And I know people are asking about, will this experience help or how many hours for this? When you start thinking things like a checklist, I think that's where students sometimes go the wrong way. It's very easy on application to see who was just following a checklist if I did this, this, and this. And that's why I should be in instead of I really was passionate about this. And this is why I did that experience or this is why I followed up with this. And so just remember on your application, we're not just looking for those healthcare experiences. We're looking at what did you spend your time doing? Were you involved on campus? Were you a leader? Were you involved in the community? So be thinking about that. Um, there really is not a magic formula that'll get you in a medical school. And I think sometimes people uh, don't always believe that. But there really isn't. But I think the biggest thing a student can do is uh, effectively communicate both on their application and in their interview why they think that medical school is the right next step for them. I might I, add. Oh, yes, it, please it, add something. Please add something. Thank you. I, 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 might, I might add that um, 
it's okay um, to reapply if you don't get in. Just think about the numbers. We get about 4,000 applications at KU School of Medicine. Uh, we interview probably under 500 of those 4,000, and we accept 211. Really good students don't get in because of the numbers. So definitely uh, improve your application and reapply. Yeah, definitely do that. My very good friend had to apply twice and the interview really helped her get into it when she got, she got, she didn't get an interview the first time. She got an interview the second time. And I want to emphasize everything they just said, make sure you can communicate. And in, in today's work environment, a lot of students are not communicating as much because they have so much on Zoom. Take that opportunity to get on Zoom more and communicate and practice and make sure you're communicating. I think social media sometimes doesn't allow us to communicate in person with people as much as we should. So make sure you practice your communication skills. We see that a lot, even as it, for students coming in um, as incoming students um, to college. So communication is definitely very important. I love this question too. So this is for the student, the members of our panel who are currently in medical school. What has been the most challenging aspect of medical school so far? Um, I guess for me, I have two. One is in preclinical was adjusting to how I studied. I didn't know how I studied. And in medical school, the information just gets thrown at you so fast. And like, you don't really have time to slow down because you need to be able to get all the information done before your first set of your boards come. And then for in the clinical years is the structuring time. So while you're not technically working, um, you have the hours, um, some services, the exact same hours as the position or residence that you're working with. And right now I'm on surgery. So I get there at like 5.30 and I'm home at like six, sometimes eight or nine, depending. And so then having to um, also like, I have a dog, I don't have kids, so I'm lucky with that. But like just getting stuff done at home and also studying as well and making all the time for that um, and making the time to like cook, be healthy, exercise and like, <laughs> sorry that's my dog sleep <laughs> it, it's kind of hard those are two most challenging but also it is really rewarding when you're at the hospital all day and then patients get better and they heal and they thank you and it's it's worth all the extra hours so I would say I'm approaching probably the most challenging part um and I don't know if um my upperclassmen and colleagues would agree, but I am preparing, um, well, getting to the part where we take our first set of board exams and it's kind of like the MCAT all over again, but like so much more important now. <laughs> and so that was what I would say is probably the most challenging is just learning how to juggle continuing setting for the classes and preparing for boards. Yeah, I'll concur with Hannah that the most academically challenging is studying for board exams because you're trying to take these two years of knowledge and make sure that you're accurately portrayed and be able to, you know, give the test your best shot. I think the most emotionally cha challenging thing is that it's really easy for us to think that all of our patients are going to get better and they're going to go home. But there are some times where like, you can't fix someone. You might know the diagnosis, you might know the clinical picture, but it doesn't mean that the treatment actually treats them or, you know, what you think would happen will happen. And it's, for me, it's really heartbreaking when, you know, you tried everything and a patient's leaving the hospital, probably the same or sicker than when they came in. Just being able to not put that on myself because that's just science. We like to pretend that medicine's a science, but it's really an art form of, you know, trying to know when to do certain things. So I think that's the hardest thing for me right now. Thank you. All right. We are trying to answer it all. You guys are doing such a great job. There's so many students with amazing questions in the chat. And we're gonna, um, we're gonna ask just one more right now. We're trying to answer the rest of them here. And we also are going to download the chat. So in case we don't get to your question, you will get an email from us with the answer to your question. Um, so it will be answered at some point. Um, but uh, just in general, if, um, to kind of summarize, if, if what is one thing you wish you would have known in your undergraduate years um, that would have prepared you for medical school or your career in medicine? I'm gonna, can I answer? Um, I think I wanna answer that. I think one thing I would have um, liked to know is that 
you don't have to do it right after undergrad. Like I know that people say that, um, but for me, I went and straight in from undergrad and I ended up actually doing a rear of clinical research because I really just need to experience something outside of um, potentially like being an MD. And I know like when you're young and you're in high school and like you really think what you wanna do. And of course, like it, it's good to like know an idea of what you wanna do, but I think my classmates who do the best um, academically, socially, emotionally are people who've taken at least like some time to mature and um, know themselves better and then come back to it um, because it really gives you a good perspective of what life is and what medicine is. And then once you know you're truly ready, you still have so many years ahead of your career um, to get into medicine. So if you're interested in something else, pursue it. That's something I wish I really would have known before. I think I would say that I wish I would have known um, what how much fun medical school really was going to be. And maybe everyone's gonna disagree with me and think I'm cliche and corny once again, but um, truly like I always kind of was anxious leading up to it. And it always was like, oh, I know I wanna do this and I know I wanna be a doctor, but it's just like this thing I have to get through. Um, and it actually has ended up, I've made some of my best friends and KU is truly, nobody said this enough, but one of the shining lights about KU in my opinion is um, just the community, like it really is. And I, I go to Salina, so it's a smaller campus and a little bit more tight knit, but it's, everyone works together and it's a lot of really great people that everyone wants to do the th same thing and everybody wants to help everyone succeed. And so I've found that I've made some of my best friends. You're finally getting to do the things that you actually want to do and what you really want to learn about. And you're not just studying boring chemistry or OCHEM or whatever. Um, it just, it makes the process a lot more enjoyable. And so I feel like I wish I kind of maybe would have known that, I guess it ended up fine because now I know, but it's, it's going to be fun. It's going to be awesome. You guys are going to love it. You know, one of the points to get into medical school, it, there are many pathways. Some pathways are from high school to college to medical school, pretty straight. And, and some pathways are, um, going into different professions. We've had uh, nurses and a, a chiropractor, I remember, uh, lawyers. Um, one of my best friends was a geologist who's an internist now. Um, so there are all kinds of pathways. It doesn't have to be straight as an arrow. It may be quite circuitous and, and it's all okay. But it, the, your pathway to medicine should eventually make sense. And, and that's what you need to convey to the admissions committee, that that pathway makes sense. Something I would say is that your four years of undergrad isn't just building up to go to med school, have fun. You know, do research that makes you excited to do it. Don't just do it to check off a box. Do that extra class in Latin American history that maybe not count for any credits, but something that you enjoy. As long as you're enjoying college, you're going to have a better four years and you have the rest of your life to specialize in something. Okay. You don't need to do everything that's on this pre-med checklist. You have the rest of your life to be a doctor. You just have four years in college. Or five, if you wish. That's fine. That's fine. Dr. Um, Becker, Dr. Steele, any closing and words? Uh, really quick, I see there's been a lot of questions about tattoos and piercings. Those are fine, um, but remember um, that you are going into a profession where you're serving others. So um, 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 just keep that in mind, I guess. Um, I don't know a better way to answer that one. Um, any like face tattoos or lip tattoos, nose tattoos and stuff, if they could get in the way or if they're an infection risk, they would be asked to be removed for sure though. So I saw that popped up several times. So my closing remark is um, do the best you can in high school, do the best you can in college, have the most fun possible in college, um, but not so much fun that you maybe um, uh, are hurt a future opportunity um, and um, um, make the best of whatever um, path you wish to take. Yeah, and I'll just finish uh, from me just saying, keep asking questions, a lot of good questions tonight. I think if you approach pretty much anyone you've heard from tonight, if you approach them from a place of you know humility and wanting to ask and learn more, I think any one of us would be more than helpful to have 
to you know answer your questions to have a longer discussion with you. Um, if you do have questions, I know Dr. Becker shared our uh, pre-med info uh, email address, so reach out there if you do have med school specific, or uh, reach out to KU admissions office. I know that you know we're all willing to answer your questions, and there's been a lot of great questions in there. Lisa might be frozen. Uh, Amy, are you still on? Oh, Lisa's uh, no longer. Lisa's frozen. back. Yeah. Am I back? All right. Are you finished, Lisa? We wrapped up for tonight. You're muted. Here, I can, I will go ahead and step in for Lisa. I think it's, um, she's frozen a little bit. We'll just go over quickly our next step. So for seniors, if you are interested um, and have not applied to KU yet, um, you still have time. We have our December 1st um, application deadline if you wanna be considered for scholarship. So make sure that you get your application in by December 1st and that's at apply.ku.edu. I think we're putting those into the chat for you. Make sure you also seniors do that FAFSA form for financial aid. Uh, it's just a crazy, crazy year. And especially for families who may have changes in their uh, financial situation, or God forbid, if anyone would get sick, we can take a look back at that FAFSA form. And if your situation does change, we can possibly do a special circumstance for you. So, uh, so make sure that you do that. Always kind of think about it as like insurance policy. So just put your fat, you know, complete that FAFSA form and put KU as one of the schools you would like for that form to be sent to. Um, and then if you do apply by December 1st, um, we'll be doing financial aid award letters um, starting um, in December. So you will be getting um, notification awards um, shortly thereafter, which will show kind of what the price breakdown will be if you decide to come to KU. And then if you do apply by December 1st, you have until April 1st to update your cumulative GPA. So let's say at the end of your seventh semester, if your GPA goes up, definitely update your application for admission. And I think it's at admissions.ku.edu forward slash update um, is where you can update your application with your new cumulative GPA. And then if you are able to take the ACT or SAT, um, you can update your test scores in that fashion, but you must do that by April 1st um, so that we can review it to see if, your schol if it would increase your scholarship. And then the all important May 1st deadline. So that is when we need to know if you are coming to KU. We, we all want you to be Jayhawks here at the University of Kansas. Um, so May 1st is that all important deadline to let us know um, if you are coming to KU in the fall. So. Um, Lisa, are yes, you, thank we you. have you I'm back. <laughs> my internet froze on me for a minute. I apologize. And you never know when that's going to happen when you're at home. And so thank you for covering the timeline. It has been great to have you all on uh, this event tonight. We again want to thank all of our partners that joined us, the faculty, the current medical students, our chancellor, our executive vice chancellor, our executive dean, and it's amazing how many wonderful people joined us this evening. We know you all have very busy schedules, so thank you so much. I, you guys have such great questions that we did want to do a quick shout out that Grace does a pre-help session um, regularly. It's a virtual session, and you can find that information at visit.ku.edu 
um, and you can scroll down and find that information on our visit page. So we'll put that in the chat as well so you have that. And once we send out um, uh, the thank you for attending, we'll put that in there too, because you could have a lot of these questions answered at one of those upcoming virtual sessions. Um, we also want to invite you to visit the campus when it's safe for you to do so. We are having on-campus visits right now. They are very small in size following all safety precautions set out um, by uh, Douglas County and the University of Kansas. So we are having those. You can find all of our information about virtual visits and on-campus visits at visit.ku.edu. We welcome your applications for those who are seniors and for juniors, we're glad you're checking things out so early. We would love to see all of you prospective students as future Jayhawks. Um, and we wish you all the best as you continue in whatever environment you're learning this year with school, whether it's in person, remote, um, hybrid. And again, thank you for joining us tonight. We hope you've enjoyed the evening.